Welcome to the seventh week of the In Times Like These recap. Now let's get into this. Starting with the Dorval family, Raymond Dorval hands his son a letter, which contains a picture of his grandmother and his mother, with a message saying, he's next. Shelley tells her husband Jeremiah that if he won't call the police, then she will, which Raymond agrees with. Jeremiah states how calling the police would be pointless since he feels like they wouldn't be able to track where the letter came from. Raymond and Shelley wonder if Jeremiah wants to wait until action is taken, endangering himself and the rest of the family. Jeremiah points out that the threat was against him and no one else, feeling like if someone tries something with him, then he'll be able to take them down himself. Later on, it's revealed that Devante Torres has been hiring someone to mess with the Dorvals since Jeremiah turned his back on him after Devante was revealed as the man who took Elvera Russo's life. Esidor Russo is surprised when Isabel Torres approaches him, but is even more surprised when Isabel asks him if he's behind the medical record that was shared all over the internet. When Esidor denies having any part in it, Isabel tells Esidor that if she finds out that he's lying, then she will no longer want to speak with him again and will move out of the estate. Esidor tells Isabel how he would never put her through such a stressful time just to get back at Devante. Isabel reminds Esidor how that's exactly how she remembers him being like when they were together. This causes Esidor to ask Isabel if she only remembers the bad, but Isabel admits that he never mistreated her. Esidor tells Isabel how sorry he is for the hurt he caused her when they were together, how he always wanted to make her happy, and how one of the worst days of his life was when he lost her. He goes on to tell Isabel how having the one night stand with her gave him a glimmer of hope that she would come back to him. The two of them stare for a moment, then Isabel kisses Esidor. Once she realizes what she's done, she walks away from him. At the courthouse, Heidi Russo and her mother-in-law Clarice show up to support Ben, who's been charged with attacking Devante. To their surprise, Quinlan Franklin shows up, making them uneasy. Quinlan tries to assure them that this is more about reporting on Devante rather than on Ben. Devante, with his son Pacho, steps up to the group, expressing his disapproval over what he just heard. Heidi reminds Devante that he shouldn't be anywhere near Ben before the hearing. Even though Devante wants to thank Ben for pleading guilty, Clarice warns Devante that if he doesn't leave soon, then he'll be lucky enough to press charges against her for attempting to take his life. Ben stands before the judge and receives his sentence, mandatory AA meetings. Zeke Franklin runs into Nichelle Torres at school, but she isn't happy to see her ex. He begins to ask Nichelle if she has any plans for Valentine's Day. She tells Zeke how she should ask him the same thing, asking if he has anything special planned with Yvette. He tells Nichelle how Yvette means nothing to him. Nichelle points out that Yvette is just his little toy. Zeke points out that if it weren't for Yvette, then they would be celebrating their first Valentine's Day together. She tells Zeke how he needs to take accountability for it. He admits to his part in their relationship ending, asking her if they can at least try to start over, especially since it's Valentine's Day and that he never stopped loving her, stating how he's certain that she never stopped loving him. Nichelle expresses how it doesn't matter what her feelings about him are since she can't trust him. Zeke tells Nichelle how he understands where she's coming from, then wishes her a happy Valentine's Day, wishing that he could spend it with her, and walks away from her. When Zeke gets back home, he stumbles across papers that Quinlan left behind, complaining that he has to eat, then looks at the notes comparing Adaku and Devante. Knowing that Devante is connected to the boss, he figures out that Adaku is most likely the boss. On Valentine's Day, Quinlan is eating dinner with her lover, Gianni Russo. Noticing that something is bothering her, he asks Quinlan what's wrong. The answer that Gianni gives is that she can't stop thinking about Ben and his battle with alcoholism. He answers that Ben just needs to keep himself out of trouble 
asking her if she's going to discuss Ben throughout their entire date. Quinlan begins to ask Gianni if he's not concerned about his own son. Gianni replies that he is, but expresses how he wanted their time together to be worry-free for Valentine's Day. She apologizes for bringing any gloom to the date, but she wonders if he's worried that he and Ben will never get close if their relationship lasts longer. Gianni tells Quinlan how he'll deal with it. Quinlan expresses how she doesn't want to be the reason why he loses his son. Gianni states how he doesn't want to lose her or feel like he has to pick and choose, stating how their love will help them figure everything out. Yet, Quinlan thinks back to the first time she shared a kiss with Ben. At Russo Jewelers, Vivian Jones is on the phone with her mother, lying about interning at another company in Tampa, telling her mother that she doesn't have to visit and that she'll be back in Orlando before she knows it. Without knocking, Alan walks into Vivian's office, which she isn't happy about. Alan apologizes, then points out how it's Valentine's Day, asking if she'd like to hang out with him afterward. Immediately, Vivian, who is disgusted, shuts Alan down, telling him that she's only attracted to black men. She goes on to ask Alan to leave and to never ask her out again, promising to work at another place, stating how his father wouldn't be pleased to know why he just lost an intern. Alan apologizes, telling Vivian how he was only trying to be friendly, but she tells him how he was being too friendly. Then Alan leaves. Later on, Vivian drops food off at Theodosius Palace to Pacho, who compliments Viv's looks. He proceeds to offer to treat her to something nice if he gets her number. Vivian tells Pacho how this would most likely be the only time they meet, telling him that if she starts dating someone, then they better be her soulmate. Pacho wishes Vivian a happy Valentine's Day, then walks off, causing them both to blush. Before Yvette leaves Wanda's apartment, Wanda expresses to her daughter how grateful she is that Yvette decided to keep her company on Valentine's Day. The two hug, then Owen shows up. Yvette gives him the side eye and reluctantly leaves. Owen asks Wanda if she noticed her daughter's attitude. Wanda believes that anything regarding the case makes Yvette nervous, asking him not to take it personally. When Owen asks how she's enjoying Valentine's Day, Wanda expresses how Yvette has helped comfort her, knowing that this is the first Valentine's Day without her husband. Since Yvette just walked out, Owen offers to keep Wanda company for the rest of the day by watching movies. Wanda expresses how she appreciates it, but states that she'll be okay on her own. Owen grants Wanda her wish, then wishes her a happy Valentine's Day. At the Mitchell estate, Udell asks Yvette why she has an attitude. Then she fills her father in on seeing Owen enter Wanda's new apartment. Harley Drake is upset to see Finnegan outside of her hotel room holding flowers and chocolate. She quickly brings him into the hotel room, asking if he wants anyone to see them. Finnegan stated how he knew that no one would see them and that she would either pull him into her room or turn him away glad that she picked the first choice. Harley asks Finnegan what he's doing. Then he tells Harley how he's wishing her a happy Valentine's Day. She tells Finnegan that they're not together, but Finnegan states how they could be if she weren't so opposed to the idea. Harley tells Finnegan how she doesn't have to remind him why they can't see each other. Finnegan agrees, but questions if that also means that she doesn't want to be with him. Harley states that if she's ready to start finding love, then she'll look to other places. Finnegan replies that a man should be looking for her and states how he found her, feeling like he's earned points since it's Valentine's Day. He goes on to tell Harley how he doesn't want their one-night stand to be a one-time thing, stating that he could find another woman, but feels like no one else would compare to her. Finnegan adds, that when he asked her to be his lawyer, the last thing he expected was to fall hard for her, asking that she give him a chance. He goes on to tell her that once he walks out of that door, he won't come back and grant her wishes to stay away 
once the divorce agreement is settled. Just as Finnegan gets ready to leave, Harley stops him and they hook up again. Udell appears in Wanda's office as he begins to ask his wife if she's having an affair with Owen Grant. Angry, Wanda asks her husband where he got such a ridiculous idea from. Udell fills Wanda in on Yvette's concerns. Annoyed, Wanda tells her husband how he should have erased their daughter's fears instead of asking her if she's been unfaithful with the prosecutor on their daughter's case. Udell reminds his wife that keeping secrets is nothing new and just has to be sure. Offended, Wanda feels like he's projecting Elvira's betrayal onto her. She goes on to remind him how she's always been faithful. Since they're on the topic of Owen, she tells Udell how Owen has been a great friend to her ever since she was kicked out of the house, wondering why Udell would even care if she starts seeing someone else. Udell reminds Wanda that Yvette's trial will begin in the coming weeks, stating that Wanda getting involved in an affair would only distract her from supporting their daughter. Wanda expresses how she understands that, but wonders if it would really be an affair if her own husband doesn't want her home. Udell warns Wanda to behave herself, since Yvette doesn't need the added stress. Before Udell walks out, Wanda reminds her husband how their daughter wouldn't have been so worried if he was willing to work things out at home. Ulyssa arrives back home, where Isabel thinks back to kissing Esidor, asking her mother what's bothering her. When Isabel tells her daughter not to worry about it, Ulyssa wonders if Isabel is still upset about Pacho living with Devante. Isabel admits that it does bother her, but won't take away the time Pacho will get to spend time with Devante before he goes to prison. Ulyssa tells her mother how she prays for her father's soul, but isn't sure if she wants to speak with him anytime soon. Just as Ulyssa expresses her feelings, Esidor walks up to them. Isabel asks her daughter to let her speak with Esidor alone. When Ulyssa obeys, Esidor asks Isabel if she's ready to discuss the elephant in the room. Isabel expresses how for decades she has pretended like she was never unfaithful to her husband, stating how it got her nowhere. She goes on to state how she'll admit what recently happened between the two of them, stating how it can never happen again. Esidor questions why. Isabel answers that she's still married, how what they had is in the past now and that her fractured family is her main priority. Esidor questions if Isabel felt nothing. All she answers is that she felt like she made a huge mistake, then walks away from Esidor. At the Odysseus Palace, Devante Torres asks Adaku why Quinlan was reporting on Ben's sentencing, wondering if she's assigned to report on his trial. Adaku admits that Quinlan has been assigned to it, he reminds Adaku that she could have hired anyone else to report on the trial, wondering why Quinlan has to be the one. She explains how it's just how the business of mass media is, reminding him how the interview drew in huge numbers. Devante tells Adaku how he doesn't need the reminder, but warns Adaku that Quinlan will only look into him further, expressing that Quinlan needs to be handled permanently. Since Quinlan is covering his case, she reminds Devante how taking her life would be a huge risk. On top of that, Adaku informs Devante that Quinlan is dating Gianni Russo. Adaku goes on to say how taking Quinlan's life would only cause more pressure and investigation. Furious, Devante wonders if he's supposed to sit around and do nothing as Quinlan attempts to do all she can to make sure he goes down for Elvira's passing. Speaking firmly, Adaku reminds Devante that he has a lawyer whose responsibility it is to make sure that he doesn't go down for what he did, stating that she doesn't want to lose a spot where she earns a lot of money. She adds that he doesn't need to convince the public that he's innocent and that he needs to convince a court that he is. Quinlan makes a call in her apartment stating that she received a letter asking what the person on the other line wants. Pacho replies that he wants to ensure 
that his father pays for his crimes. She begins asking him how she thinks she'll be able to grant his wish. He answers that he noticed her documentary on Elvera Russo and saw that she was bold enough to give Devante tough questions, knowing that Adaku wouldn't have allowed that. Curious, Quinlin begins to question if Pacho knows about the connection between Devante and Adaku. Pacho admits that he does. Then, Quinlin asks how and what the connection is. He responds that it's a lot to reveal over the phone, requesting a time and place to meet in person. This is when Quinlin asks Pacho why she shouldn't think this is a trap. Pacho answers that he wants Theodosius's palace and wants to protect his father from his family, stating that he's only been close to Devante so that Theodosius's palace could be handed over to him. Quinlin wonders if this is about getting power or getting justice. Pacho admits how it's both, especially since both Devante and Adaku are dangerous people. At Russo Jewelers, Alan goes on camera, expressing his disappointment in the hospital for covering for Devante, who he feels paid the hospital off. He goes on to tell people that if they check into Theodosius' palace, then they'll be supporting a monster. After Alan gets off his phone, Vivian walks in, angered at Alan's rant on his live stream, fearing that it could create a lawsuit for the company to fight against. When she asks Esidor if he had any part in it, Esidor lies, telling his intern that he is just as surprised and that he'll handle it. Once she leaves, Esidor tells his son how Devante won't be happy when a number of guests begin checking out of the hotel and a lack of people show up, making Theodosius' palace look like a ghost town. In the lobby, Vivian is on the phone with her mother, who asks when Vivian will visit her. Vivian claims that she'll visit her mother soon, and they tell each other how much they miss each other. Once Vivian is off of the phone, Vivian vows to make the Russos pay for what they took from their family, but states how she can't have her mother get in her way. Why does Vivian want revenge, and what did the Russo family do to hers? Devante is on the phone with someone, ready to cause harm to Jeremiah and Shelley. At Jeremiah's HVAC business, he's loading his gun as Shelley stumbles across him doing so. She tells her husband how he is certain that their family is in danger, stating how he usually doesn't check his gun at work. Jeremiah assures his wife that he's just taking the safest precautions since they haven't heard any threats recently. Shelley asks Jeremiah if the silence is making him worried. He answers that he's not feeling worried, but cautious. She tells him how they shouldn't have to look over their shoulder until something pops off. In Jeremiah's opinion, something needs to pop off for this situation to come to an end. Outside of the business, Shelley tells Jeremiah that she's not going to stand still and watch him get involved in a possible shootout, warning Jeremiah that the next thing that pops off, she will call the police, even if it makes her look stupid. Suddenly, Jeremiah notices a car charging at Shelley's way. He pushes Shelley out of the way. Then Jeremiah gets hit as Shelley proceeds to scream out her husband's name. While standing outside of the corner, selling illegal substances, Zeke's fellow dealer, Ronnie, asks him why his head seems all over the place, wondering if Zeke is thinking about Nichelle. Zeke asks Ronnie if he ever thought about the identity of the big boss. Ronnie tells Zeke how that answer is above either of their pay grade. Once Zeke explains to Ronnie how he understands that he doesn't know either, but questions if Ronnie was ever curious about who the person is, how they rose to power, and if it's a public figure, who they know. The answer that Ronnie gives is that being curious about that could cost him his life. Zeke questions if the big boss would really take someone out for stumbling across their identity. Ronnie questions if there's something that Zeke needs to tell him. The response that Zeke gives is that he's just talking and thinking. Ronnie advises him to do less of that and to focus on selling product and making money. Meeting in the wooded area of a park, Pacho reveals to Quinlan that Adaku Bello doesn't exist. This revelation confuses Quinlan. Pacho informs the reporter that Adaku Bello 
is actually Adaku Danjuma, the daughter of Kalu Danjuma. Quinlin asks if Pacho is saying that Adaku took over her father's organization. Pacho answers that she did, and she asks how he knows this. He reveals that before he left Valley Park, he wanted to ask his father to invest in his online retail business, which is when he overheard Devante speaking on the phone with Adaku about using the beachfront of the hotel to sell illegal substances. Quinlan is troubled at what she knows, but questions how he figured out that Adaku was Kalu Danjuma's daughter. Pacho expresses how that was one reason why he had to leave. No longer respected his father and wanted to safely look into Adaku without endangering himself and his family. Revealing that he hired a PI to look into Adaku's past and uncovered that she was the secret daughter of Kalu Danjuma. Knowing that her younger brother Zeke sells illegal substances, Quinlan asks if the organization uses kids to sell their product. Once Pacho confirms this, he states that if his father gets away with what he did to Elvera Russo, then he will do much more damage to many more people. Can't get enough of the crazy world of in times like these? Then treat yourself to a binge watch of in times like these. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. You're not ready for what's to come, but tune in anyway.